Okay, welcome to the next virtual office hours for the MOCA capstone project course. We're gonna to talk today about a number of different topics related to questions people have asked and uh, on the website, which we'll switch to in just a moment. And we'll also, of course, take your questions live. I see we have about 10 people joining so far, which is good. Hopefully you're able to hear us as well. So uh, why don't we go ahead and start by just recapping a few things. I'm gonna go over to the website here real quick and share the website. There we go. So as you probably have figured out by now, the projects are up, the final projects are up on the website. So you should be able to go ahead and, and uh, see the final rubrics, which shouldn't be very surprising. They should look pretty much like the ones we already had before. We also wanted to, I just wanted to reiterate the current schedule for when things are due. The second activity is opened a couple days ago and it'll be due on the 23rd of November and then have an evaluation date of the 5th. We've actually uh, we've actually asked the powers that be if we can extend the course. Haven't heard back yet, so I don't know what the don't know what the status is on that. That is not something unfortunately we are able to do unilaterally. Let's go ahead over to the discussion forum. It's good to see so much activity. A lot of people have been extremely active over the past uh, weeks, which is good. Really appreciate everybody, especially the community TAs, pitching in and, and helping to provide feedback and guidance based on their experiences from the capstone dry run, which ended a couple weeks ago. And I think people did very well. So that's great. Uh, let's go ahead over to the virtual office hours page, which is right here and we'll click on second virtual office hours questions. And we'll just go ahead and uh, go through them in, in the order that they're here. There's maybe a page and a half or so of them. Question number one, will there be another virtual office hours session? The answer is definitively yes. So uh, we're, we're here, we're proof of that. Uh, there's also a question here about having a complete example of one-to-many relations with JPA. And I think Jules just answered that a few minutes ago. So I'll post a updated example in the mobile cloud repo and then also post a link to it in the uh, uh, forums with how you use one-to-many um, with Spring Data JPA and then also examples of how you can do the same things without using one-to-many. Um, so this may be helpful for some people that want to use some NoSQL databases or other things. So I'll, I'll post detailed uh, um, examples and code that have all the answers to the questions around um, one-to-many from the forums in the uh, in the uh, mobile cloud repo, and then all of that uh, information, I'll also post links to it in the forums later um, tonight or tomorrow morning. Next question is, can we extend the due date? I just mentioned we're, we're checking into that to see if that's possible. We'll, we'll let you know as soon as we know. Let's, let's assume, for sake of argument, we're not going to extend it just because that way people will keep working towards the deadline. But if it does get extended, then that's good. Uh, here is a question about, open source licenses, I, I put a link here. There's a website which has a bunch of open source licenses and you're welcome to choose whichever one you like. They're very different actually, so you might wanna take a look at them. The ones people typically end up using in practice are either the Apache license or the so-called MIT license or the GNU license. They each have their own pros and cons. Uh, there was a question about the Amazon API. It looks like Adam responded. We have not got a response from Amazon yet, but the good news is there's a big database worth of movies at this point that you can leverage. So it really shouldn't be a big issue, I don't think. There was also a question about the Mutabo rubric number 4B and uh, Adam has fixed that. So that should all be consistent, which is good. And um, let's see, there's more questions about one to many, many to one. I assume that those are yep. addressed with Jules a moment ago. Uh, can people use HTTP servlet request in an auto-wired manner? Yeah, so uh, it you don't want to, you, you typically, the way that you, if you really need access to HTTP servlet request, you can um, have it as a parameter to your controller method, uh, and, and Spring will automatically provide it for you. Although, in general, there's lots of annotations and things that Spring provides that you don't have to directly expose your logic to HTTP specific uh, details. 
So I followed up. Um, there's some good answers in the forums from the community TAs, and also I followed up just you know uh, uh, emphasizing what they said. If you can get away with using one of the other annotations to not um, explicitly have that uh, exposed to your controller methods, that's better. But if you do need it, you can just add it as a parameter, and Spring will magically know that it needs to pass in the, the current server request into your controller method. Great. Let's see. Best practice for collecting form data over several screens. Um, what's the best practice in Android for collecting form data over several screens before submitting it? And there's a whole bunch of responses. So hopefully those give you the responses you need. If you have other questions that uh, can provide additional feedback, that's great. Um, let's see. Example of OAuth 2 on GAE. Yeah, so uh, people are asking, someone asked if there was a, a, an example of using OAuth 2 on Google App Engine. And I don't have any examples of it, and it may be tricky to get Spring's implementation of OAuth 2 working on Google App Engine. Um, you are probably better off for, for if you are using Google App Engine to try to use uh, Google accounts or one of their Google App Engine uh, specific features to make it easier. Um, you could also use just standard um, sessions, uh, you know, cookie-based sessions or something else that's built into Spring, and that will work. Uh, easily with Google App Engine. But if you're trying to get the OAuth 2 samples, um, it may take a bit of work to get it out there. And I'm not aware of any examples of, of people that have done that. Um, so that may not be the most fruitful approach to go after. You probably want to use some other authentication mechanism or some Google-specific um, API provided by App Engine if you're going to use App Engine. Great. Uh, question here about multimedia capture feature, and looks like there's a forward to a discussion about that. So hopefully that question has been addressed. Again, if these are not addressed, let us know. Um, fact item number 32, that looks like something I answered a day or so ago. Let's see what that was about. It's taking a little time to there we go. Oh, this was about keeping things anonymous. Yeah, try, try to keep the stuff as anonymous as you can. Um, I know if, if you're uploading stuff to your YouTube page, it may be hard to keep that entirely anonymous, but you know, just, we're trying to make it so that people uh, people's personal, personal characteristics are kept out of this as much as possible. Uh, there was a discussion about requirements for the symptom management app as far as alerts per day and Emily has answered that, so that's addressed. Does retrofit support post of collection of objects or object with collection? Yes, it does support that. So if you have a object that has an embedded collection with it, it'll send it across, and you can also send um, collections of objects. It, and all of them just get serialized to JSON, and then on the spring side, it can uh, deserialize it. There's a question here about ordering the buttons for submitting the uh, projects. I will send that on to the Coursera folks because they're the ones who did that. And so we will see if they can uh, fix that. Ordering of submission buttons. I'm just emailing that off as we speak, as we talk. Please address this question. That would make sense to me to fix that. I don't know whether it's easy or hard once they've been set. But uh, hopefully that can be addressed somehow. Let's see. How to create an Android app session. Ah, OK, there you go. Good, good answer. Shared preferences will do the trick. That makes a lot of sense. Shared preferences, under the hood, shared preferences are implemented using a Java hash map that it has been made persistent. And uh, it's kind of a cool piece of code to look at to see how it works. And it also gives you a good feeling for the fact that it should be fairly, fairly efficient to do. 
Um, let's see. Here's a question. Oh, how to finish the capstone project in eight weeks. Uh, uh, Vladan had a very nice summary of what he did in order to be able to finish the capstone project in eight weeks during the during the dry run. I think that the two key things I would pass along as far as finishing the project don't don't run in don't give uh, into the temptation of trying to do something super duper fancy at first. Get it to work first, and then if, as time permits, go ahead and make it fancier at the end. Don't spend tons of time on uh, all kinds of fancy graphics and then not get the the database portion done, for example. And secondly, probably should have said this earlier, you know, make sure that you pick a project that's doable by you. Uh, the projects, in some sense, have different degrees of sophistication, and some are a little easier than others. Some are definitely easier than others if you just want to get something up and working. So that's also important, picking the right one. Um, there was a question here about, can you hard code the accounts? The answer is yes. So that was addressed a couple of days ago. Um, let's see. Do we get counts for the midpoint submissions for each project? I posted that about uh, three days ago. So looks like about um, about half the people are doing symptoms management, and then maybe uh, I don't know a third of the people are doing potlatch, and a small number of people are doing Mutabo. Although honestly, if if uh, push came to shove, I would probably be tempted to say that the Mutabo app is the easier of the three. But uh, that, again, comes back to what you want to, to learn and what you want to try. Let's see. What's a touch gesture? So looks like long press will do the trick, which is good. And let's see. What else do we have here? Would it be wise to initially develop the application without OAuth? Um. You, you certainly you can if you want to remove OAuth you can um, comment out the parts where you're importing that part of the configuration into uh, so anything that's related to OAuth configuration if you remove that from your Spring configuration and then very importantly you want to go into the actual build.gradle file and remove any references to Spring security. If you have either one of those, Spring will default to adding some sort of security to the application. So if you want to completely remove security in order to go and get all of the um, request paths working and be able to test them easily, you can do that. Just make sure you remove it both in the build.gradle file and within the configuration of your Spring application. And then once you have all the request paths working, you could go back and uh, add in OAuth. The only challenge there is if you have anything that that requires any of your um, uh, logic, for for example, requires knowing the identity of the client sending the request or the user, um, and that's you know not passed directly in the in your request. Then it's going to be hard to de develop the two separately. Um, but you can also just go ahead and use OAuth and use a, uh, a client like Postman to send an initial request to get a request token and then use that in your uh, um, authorization header when you're making subsequent requests for testing. Um, so another question, isn't it possible to add, is it possible to add one more example, video service with OAuth 2 and MongoDB to the mobile cloud server side project example set? Um, it's, it's probably a little bit, uh, um, you know, yeah, we could go and add yet another example, but you know, there's OAuth 2 has been covered and MongoDB has been covered separately. So I'd say it probably makes sense, you know, to go and look at those examples. If you're looking at how you would go about creating a user detail service that's built on top of MongoDB, um, you know, that should be somewhat straightforward to figure out from looking at uh, some of the examples that use Spring Data JP about how you might create a user account. Um, and in general, I would say if you're going to go that request that route, make sure that you've already completed the assignment with hard coded you know, user and client accounts, because that's going to add some significant complexity to have a registration and sign up process. So I'd get it working with hard coded accounts before you go and try to add the, the next step. Um, but I probably won't add a, a, an example of that specific combination of OAuth 2 and MongoDB. But um, if you look at the examples, they should have what you need. There's a couple other questions sort of along these lines, too, I guess. Um, let's take a look and see. Um, 
In the examples for the cloud service class that require authentication, users are hard-coded into memory. While this is sufficient for the in-class project and local testing is not acceptable for real-world deployment, thus I'm wondering what would be needed to change the video service with OAuth2 if we were to expect user credentials to be stored via Spring JPA and hooked up to OAuth2. So the basic way that you would do go about doing this, and there's there's also some answers in the forums, is to create your own user detail service implementation that uh, basically has a user object of some kind and, and persists it with JPA and looks them up. And then also a uh, list of clients that could possibly be stored in the database as well. And you would use that user detail service and client detail service implementations that are backed by the database rather than backed by memory. So you would create your own implementations of those interfaces. And then in the configuration of, of OAuth inside of the Spring configuration, rather than using the in-memory versions, you would just provide your versions of those uh, in, in place of the uh, uh, implementation. And I'll try to find some examples of open source code that do that um, so that people can take a look if they want to. But again, this is going to add, you know, will add significant complexity to the app. So make sure you get it working first without doing this. And, and we sort of specifically scoped it to set hard-coded usernames. Um, user accounts were OK, specifically because it does add a lot of complexity, and we wanted the project to be doable in the time frame. But I'll, I'll try to find some examples that I can post and link to. Um, but it's, it's basically replacing the user details service and client details um, with your own implementation. OK, so let's see. There's a couple other things. What's the final date for the assignment? We've covered that. Um, let's see, more examples. Jules talked about that. Can the connectivity manager be used to control when intents are decued in a running intent service? Uh, let's see. Is it desirable to have patience? Uh, Yeah, so the it, the Android Intent Service, if, if I understand Ron's question, the Android Intent Service is pretty simple, uh, and it just basically keeps a queue of incoming intents and then dispatches them via threads running in the background. So uh, I don't think you're going to be able to do sophisticated things with the Intent Service, although you could certainly write your own queue and do it any old way you want. So that would be another option if, if you felt that that was important. And I think there's just really one more question. <laughs> Can the CRUD repository instances in JPA manage foreign key mapping when using a relational database? So um, my uh, there's a bunch of good examples. Um, again, this is related to at uh, one to many and many to one. And the new uh, code example that I'll be posting in the mobile cloud repository will explain this in the readme and, and sort of the relationship between these things. Great. So let's see if there's any questions people have had on the forum. Uh, not a whole lot. So there's a one question. Let me see. Let me go back to stop sharing. There we go. Uh, so the, the question from Sean is, will there be any other virtual office hour sessions? There, there might be. It depends on what kind of questions people have. Um, we have about 30 people on today, and, and hopefully we've been able to answer everybody's questions. So we'll, we'll probably do maybe one more before the, for the semester, the uh, course is done. Uh, one thing I will mention is we're, we're starting to gear up for the next round of MOOCs that we'll be doing. And as you guys probably already know, uh, Professor Porter is doing his second MOOC on, on mobile Android programming. And we're going to start our MOOCs when his is done. Right now, it's looking as if we're going to be doing some new stuff this time, not exactly the same that we had done before for the ones that, that Jules and I do. In particular, it uh, looks like I'll be doing a course on concurrent programming with Java. Let me go show you a little bit about that. If I can bring up my web browser. There we go. All right, let's go over here and Share that guy, and we'll go over here. Uh, go to live lessons, concurrent programming in Java. So uh, 
Last week, I was up in Chicago filming a series of videos for a Pearson Live Lessons course, which will hopefully go live by the beginning of January or so. And those topics were based upon, but heavily, heavily extended the material we had covered in the POSA MOOC last year. So when we did the, the POSA MOOC last year, we talked about some Java concurrency stuff and a lot of Android concurrency stuff. So I went off and have created a whole new course just focusing on the Java concurrency. And this is a table of contents of the material that I have in that course. So there's a bunch of stuff that we, we covered very briefly in the POSA MOOC that have, has now been extend, extended quite a bit. There's a whole discussion now about the Java executor framework, a lot more coverage about atomic operations and variables, things like uh, the new stamp lock, mechanisms for reader-writer locks, phaser barrier synchronizers, just lots and lots more stuff. So the next course we're going to be doing for this, cl this class is going to be based on uh, concurrent programming in Java. And that course is going to be interesting for a couple reasons. First, we're going to be doing new material, but also we're going to be doing it live. So unlike the last version where everything was recorded and we did virtual office hours live, we're going to do all the course material live. So it's going to be a lot more interactive. And uh, after every you know 10 minute segment, I will go ahead and answer questions in real time for anybody who's who's joined. And naturally, we'll do the same thing we do with the virtual office hours. All the the lectures will be recorded, and then we'll turn them into videos, which you can then watch at your convenience if you can't join live or if you want to go back and, and learn more of the stuff. So we'll be doing that. That'll be the next thing. That'll be concurrent programming in Java, probably starting in mid-January time frame after people are back from holiday. And then uh, and then after that, we'll, we'll probably have a course that's on Android concurrent programming. And, and that course will go off in a bunch of different directions that we didn't cover before as well. We'll cover more things like content providers and other things we didn't really have a chance to go into in much detail. And that'll be done live as well. And then if we have uh, really get inspired, we might do a course entirely on uh, concurrency and communication patterns for Java and Android. And then at that point, Jules will start and he's going to be doing a security course for security, mobile, mobile and cloud security, which will be a little different from what we covered before. And then he'll have his MOOC on, uh, on the uh, cloud computing. And so, even if you've taken some of the earlier stuff, you might want to loop back around and watch some of the things we'll be doing because it's going to be different and uh, more fresh, hopefully, because it's going to be all done live. Um, there was also a question here about posting an example of one-to-many associations for use on the Google app environment. I'm not sure if we're going to do that or not. Uh, I can, I can uh, post links. Google has a lot of good examples for JDO and one-to-many. So, um, I can post some links in the forums to Google's uh, examples or example code for that, but I probably won't create a separate example just for Google App Engine. Um, but I will post uh, links to the, the Google documentation for that. Judy said, uh, things on the screen are too blurry to read. Well, the good news, Judy, is that all this stuff is recorded. And so uh, later today, I will put a video out, which will have as high resolution as, as we can get, which is pretty good. So uh, if you're having problems seeing the, the blurriness, it might be on your end. But once we produce the video, you can go back and watch it, and everything should be nice and, and crisp and easy to read. Although, honestly, we didn't really cover a lot of stuff in the virtual office hours that required the ability to have high-resolution images. Everything is just basically answering questions from the discussion forum. I'm having trouble getting Spring to auto-wire more than one repository. Is this the correct annotation in app in application Java? Um, it looks correct from the. It's hard, a little bit hard to read on here, but it looks roughly correct what you've got here. Um, if you if one of the two is missing, you might you one option might be uh, you could check if it's because of. You can check if the annotation is wrong pretty easily by um, if you remove one of them and see if it'll auto wire the other. Um, that would make sure that it can find either one. But if it only um, fails if both of them are there, then that's probably um, could be a problem. Basically, what this annotation is going to do is go and look at the package containing the video repository class and the user repository class, 
and then find all of the JPA repositories within those two packages and try to auto-wire them in. It's also possible that your repository implementations are missing annotations or other things, uh, or there's some other issue. But at first glance, um, in this little column, it looks correct to me. Um, but it'd also be good to post that in the forum just so that I can see it um, in a little bigger format if, if you're having trouble. But I would definitely suggest trying trying it with just one repository and then just the other repository. Make sure each of those work individually. You might find that one of the repositories is missing some annotations or other things that you need, and that's why it's not being auto-wired. There's a question about extending the deadline. We already talked about that. Um, we've asked the powers that be if that's possible. We'll see what they say. We are not in a position to make that decision unilaterally. Uh, there's a question from Sean for the HTTP requirement. Is it sufficient to use a load balancer uh, or a pass platform as a service provided solution? Yeah, so if you want to do SSL termination at the load balancer with like uh, Amazon Web Services, that's perfectly fine. And in fact, that can be uh, an easier way to get SSL set up is just terminate at the load balancer and then run HTTP from the load balancer to your instance. Um, th that's fine. You can also uh, uh, do all kinds of complicated things with the Am Amazon load balancers or other load balancers for whatever platform as a service you're using. But that's that's perfectly fine to use their HTTPS termination. And there's a question about um, Butterknife. Yeah, um, Butterknife is a great little framework for Android that allows you to saves you a lot of, of code related to find view by ID and um, wiring up on click handlers and that type of stuff. Um, it's not covered in the lectures, and I believe I posted an updated uh, version that doesn't use Butterknife, but um, essentially uh, what these things are doing is um, some of these annotations are basically doing the equivalent of find view by ID. So you may say, you may see like add inject view, and it's referencing r.id. some view and basically all it's going to do is it's automatically going to make the call to find view by ID, cast it to the right type and assign it to that member variable. Or you may see some um, annotations related to click handling and all of that's going to do is look up the appropriate view that you're referencing with r.id.blank, um, automatically um, create a click handler, add it to that view and then have that click handler call the particular method that you've annotated with that um, annotation. But it's all of this stuff related to OAuth that's in there is completely separate from Butterknife. Butterknife is just something that I put in there too, um, because it's a great framework. I thought it'd be nice to have an example of using it um, and simplifying some of the Android view code. Another question about the capstone being reoffered. There's uh, plans to do that. I don't have a date for you. My guess, given the schedule of other courses we are planning to do between now and and then, is probably sometime in the summer. So I would guess probably July, maybe June, July, something like that. But that's just a guess. I don't really know offhand. OK, well, I think that was all the questions that people had had asked. If you have any more questions, feel free to, to chime in. Uh, what I'll do is I'll go ahead and create a new virtual office hour three section on the website so that if you're uh, if you have questions, you can ask them there. We won't lose them in the sea of Office Hour 2 questions that we just went through that might be easy to overlook if we're not careful. So I'll go ahead and put those out there, and then uh, we'll produce the video for this, and I'll upload it, as always, to, the, to, to YouTube and to the website once it's done, and everybody can go back and watch it. So thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Adam, for being uh, here in, in uh, person and in spirit. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll look forward to talking okay. to you soon. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye.